Very good morning to you. It's Wednesday the 10th of March and it's just coming up to 7am here in London. So just wanted to give you the regular briefing of what happened on the close of Wall Street overnight in Asia and then our kind of outlook for the day ahead. I'm going to kick things off with the heat map of the S&P 500 and what a difference a day makes. Um, it's almost the mirror opposite of what we had from yesterday, which was all of the big mega cap tech were lower, now all higher, reversing that move. And in fact, the NASDAQ 100 as an index posted its biggest rally since November. Um, as you can see here, likes of Apple up 4%, Amazon and Facebook similar margins, but check out Tesla shares up 20%. Um, after they were getting hammered in some of that rotational uh, play that we had been seeing. Um, risk sentiment generally as well supported um, by the latest three-year auction that came out of the US. We're going to talk about that in a bit more detail in a moment. But this was the first of three auctions for the week and people were a little bit apprehensive given the weakness seen in the seven-year US auction two weeks ago. And actually it came out okay and that actually provided a bit of relief. Yields actually dropped further after that auction which further helped just general risk sentiment overall. And just looking at the NASDAQ here, um, on the chart for the time being and a bit of a range break as well of that previous double top of the week's price action which came after we kind of surged out of the gate at the open on the NYSE yesterday and that also just helping some of the price activity from a technical perspective and obviously we just powered on up um, all the way into the close pretty much uh, before a little dip that was seen uh, in the final half an hour of trade into the closing bell faded a little bit in the overnight session uh, the asia pack region generally just kind of towing the line if you like and, and mildly positive following the positive handover that we had in the us but nothing to really read into in terms of the handover going into the european open where obviously we were we were in the market yesterday to observe much of that rally so a couple of things here then so a bit of a reversal of course after the heavy selling pressure the nasdaq have been seeing We've had a bit of a pop through here technically through the week's top end of the range as you can see that it's formed here. On the daily um, it, it doesn't look, um, you know, 4% 4, 4 is a, definitely a big move and uh, the biggest move in many months for the Nasdaq in a singular session. But when you look at the chart on this perspective it doesn't actually look that that big. Um, definitely though the the downside level that we'd marked up before this kind of highlighted one at 12 to 34 is the level that's held up so far that previous era of resistance and support going back through october november december uh, of last year and then the retest we've just had in the last couple of days will be a key one to watch uh, just generally going forward over the the medium term um, just having a look then, the other things that I was reading last night when it comes to the NASDAQ was the FT were reporting that some analysts said that some uh, the big move that we had yesterday was propelled by short covering as well. Uh, obviously, there's been a lot of um, press coverage about uh, how uh, the, the kind of switch through in, in the rotational play and, and the, the tech stocks would be the biggest casualties given the movement in the high yield environment. And so perhaps, yeah, a bit of short covering as the market kind of has snapped up against people in those short positions could well be um, part of that. And uh, perhaps that technical level as well, just helping further squeeze people out of some of those positions that were looking at more optimal shorts um, at around that range high in the short term. Um, Citigroup analysts in a note last night said that they saw such a shift or warned such a shift um, could prove fleeting like what we saw yesterday and uh, which could cap the size of the move obviously if it is just short covering it doesn't really change perhaps then generally people's fundamental perception that there's perhaps better sector positioning in other areas uh, that have seen just generally greater outperformance against the tech and uh, nasdaq heavy uh, or the the tech heavy nasdaq of late uh, the s p yesterday finished up around 1.4 it was almost the, the reverse that we've seen recently. The Dow's up just 0.1 compared to the 4% you know, gains that we've seen in the NASDAQ. How sustainable is that? Um, I don't actually think it is sustainable. Uh, and I don't think that we've seen personally yet uh, the bottom for the NASDAQ. Um, but overall, I must stress that this is uh, still, for me, an idea of 
a little bit of movement across the exposure that people want to certain stock sectors. I still think ultimately when the economy reopening globally, that generally it's a it's a positive narrative for stocks in general. It's just that some are going to outperform others, uh, and it's about strategic placement then to to benefit from that move. So that's the overnight um, kind of session in China overnight. Um, one thing to mention was we did have some uh, data. So on the inflation side, PPI rose at the fastest pace in more than two years in February. One point seven percent was above expectations of one point five. Uh, consumer prices fell 0.2% last month from a year earlier, um, slightly better than the projected 0.3% decline people are anticipating. Here's a, here's a chart of these metrics just to give you a bit of context of the general pattern that we've had. And probably the biggest thing that you're seeing here is consumer prices are still remaining uh, fairly flat line, uh, having, having kind of crashed through the period of the pandemic, of course. Uh, just given the uh, the sharp fall in the inflationary conditions, given the, the onset of the pandemic and lockdowns and so forth. But what's interesting now is that the Chinese economy has been reopening to a certain respect for some time. Economic um, data, which we're seeing you know, sharp improvements in the likes of the US recently, that's been happening in China for some time. Uh, and that then is leading to the PPI prices uh, just moving further and further away, that kind of... Um, divergence that we're used to seeing through this period of recent years starting to materialize again and so you've got um, activity picking up but consumer still remaining a little lackluster uh, at this point in time in terms of their confidence it, it would translate to um, Chinese producer prices have been a major contributor to global inflation uh, in recent decades because if you think about supply chains uh, and they've become more integrated generally speaking and expensive oil given the surge in prices that we've had a shortage of chip um, uh, computer chips globally soaring shipping costs these could all be significant tailwinds for global inflationary pressures that may then reverberate down the line and make the cost of goods more expensive just generally and this all coming in that time where inflation expectations are rising generally with the opening uh, reopening of uh, of different economies around the world so yeah quite interesting to to have a look at this it definitely kind of feeds into the more uh, kind of uh, aggressive people talking about inflation emerging uh, emerging in the future this would would play to that uh, particular view overnight then the other things that we have had is the the dollar has firmed up a little bit during the asia pacific session so the Dixie's trading up about a quarter of 1%. So consequently, the major pairs are trading a little bit softer this morning. I wouldn't say anything too dramatic. Um, more greenback based than I'd say individually euro sterling narratives that are driving these uh, currency markets at the moment. So euro and cable down about 25 pips each respectively. One thing, um, cable has failed obviously yesterday to reclaim the 139 handle. Uh, a few people looking at the cross-channel tensions which are brewing at the moment with the EU nations saying that they're getting behind Brussels to plan to launch legal action uh, against the UK for easing the impact of Brexit on Northern Irish uh, businesses. So that's still ongoing at the moment and there's been quite a lot of the vaccine supply manufacturing news still um, kind of going back and forth between Britain and Europe at the moment as well as just keeping half an eye on. Um, Otherwise, the other market I just quickly wanted to comment on was oil. Um, WTI crude uh, has has moved substantially lower actually over the course of the last two days. I mean, from from the peak that we saw at the reopening of Globex trade on Sunday night, uh, which was up akin to sixty eight dollars, we're actually off nearly seven percent from those highs. And um, actually, technically speaking. We are trading beneath what what is quite an interesting near-term level. You can see here was the previous highs of resistance back on the 25th, 26th of February. It helped support price after the OPEC Plus decision last week on the initial uh, surge in price on the pullback to then take us all the way up to, to where we were. We, we're now below that point and that level was holding quite nicely into the US close last night, but it's been broken down in the Asia PAC session, so prices have drifted down. Um, we have had the API oil inventories last night. 
Um, I must stress that these are incredibly noisy at the moment. So personally, I don't really put too much weight in them, specifically given the fact that, as we saw last week, this is all reflective of the general disruptions that we saw in Texas and generally nationwide with the great freeze in the US just a few weeks ago. Um, but nonetheless, the headline crude number was a build of 12.792 million. I don't, I'm not sure really where, where these analysts get these forecasts. I mean, it's so off, off beat that I don't, I don't think you should really look at that too much. Just the, the fact that this is obviously an incredibly sizable figure in a historical data context. Cushing, a bill of 300,000 gasoline draw of eight and a half million. So yeah, mixed and, and particularly noisy given those um, those weather impacts that we we saw emerge in last week's data. But overall, I think with this oil price, um, coming onto a daily chart, I think it's, it's always really good to just look at the market in perspective. Um, and you know the oil market has just been on an absolute tear since November, pretty much when we were trading at one point down at the low thirty dollar mark, and we've got all the way up to uh, you know the best point of sixty eight bucks or, or thereabouts on the high. So if I look at two kind of things here, even if we were just looking at the recent price surge that we've had over um, since the third of March to the peak, that was fourteen percent. So we're still up a good 7%, even with the pullback that we've had. Even if you're looking from February, where this initial or latest phase of, of, of bid has come in, then we're still up about 22%. And if you go for November low in oil, we're still up about 87, 88%. So for me, I know on the intraday market, this feels um, quite heavy in the price, but ultimately I really don't see uh, a great deal here that makes me nervous for what still is more uh, a generally bullish view that I maintain for oil. I'm sure is there, pri is there scope for this price to, to pull back? Uh, there certainly might be. The thing I'd be looking at as a trigger for that would be the dollar uh, in the short term if you're trading intraday. But I still think that we'll remain uh, our heads above this kind of 60 marker for for the time being and for, for the rest of this week, I would anticipate. Okay, uh, one of the other things I just wanted to mention was then the auction that we had last night. And actually just looking here, it's gonna keep the US tenure up for a moment. And the US auction last night for the three year came out here. I'm obviously looking at the 10 year rather than uh, shorter data maturities just for the sake of you know we, we tend to focus on the benchmark for, for trading purposes but the 10-year the moved up from around 05 prior to the release and we saw a peak uh, at around 15 and a half so a decent 10 tick move there uh, don't get me wrong yields were already pulling back anyway uh, through the UK European and US sessions so definitely that was helping contributing to the surge back into short term some of the equity space and, and the tech names in particular, but then was given a further bump on the three year auction. So just running you through what exactly happened there. Um, the auction priced at 0.355%, which was well above last month's 0.19%, uh, and was solidly or 0.4 basis points below the 0.359% when issued. So it was definitely uh, a million miles away from the massive tail that we saw in the seven year auction two weeks ago. And a big tail for bond auctions means that there's really a lack of demand for that, that particular issue and that bids generally are quite uncompetitive. Um, the bid to cover was also pretty uh, impressive. It, it came in uh, at 2.689 from 2.391 previous and was the highest bid to cover ratio we've had since June of 2018. Uh, then although the uh, what we call the, the internals of the auction were a little bit softer, generally speaking, there was just a kind of relief. Um, a lot There's 120 billion, I think in total, coming to market in issuance this week. and. You know, just given how bad that seven year was and the, the, the price drop that that saw and just another reason for the whole high yield move. 
people were a little bit apprehensive going to this first one. I would say that the 10-year auction tonight arguably is more important, just given its maturity, and that'll be at 6 p.m. London time. Um, but overall, yeah, bit of a sigh of relief for markets yesterday, and I think that did play its hand into some of the, the general risk appetite that was being observed yeah, in the intraday. The whole Treasury curve um, after, the, uh, after the complete breakdown of non-dealer community participation uh, in last month's seven-year auction benefited from, from the news when it came out. Um, one thing that was quite interesting that the guys at News Squawk pointed out was that they said part of the underlying demand is likely to be investors seizing the attractive carry or roll uh, attributes of the three-year, which offers double the yield of the two-year. So obviously, as a participant, you're going to want to lock, lock in a better yield if possible. Uh, and just given then rolling over and carries on a similar dated maturity, was this actually more functional, if you like, from an operational point of view to kind of support demand rather than actually underlying just general appetite? Um, in some respects. So I still think there's some to play for for the 10 year tonight. And I think that definitely warrants watching as a main key event for, for the session ahead. Um, the other, other final thing I wanted to mention on the uh, calendar side of things is you do have the senior House Democrat Hoyer said last night that basically uh, he anticipates the House to consider and pass the COVID-19 stimulus bill at 9 a.m. Eastern, so a bit later on this afternoon, London time, uh, today. And when that bill passes in the House, it would then go straight to Biden for signing into uh, into place. Now, I don't really see much now with this particular situation other than the formalities, to be quite to quite honest. So there's something to be aware of in terms of headlines, I'm sure you'll see in a few hours' time. Um, Calendar-wise, then, the UK European morning is particularly quiet. There's nothing major happening. So that takes us into the US session where there is, uh, which is really the US CPI numbers at 130, where the expectation here for the headline is at 1.7% uh, against expectations of 1.4%. Uh, again, the core readings will be quite important. The headline, how influenced is it being from just generally the surging oil prices that we've had of late? Um, but just again, given the sensitivity to inflation and subsequently then yield reactions, it's definitely worth keeping an eye on the CPI data 130 and the bond auction uh, at 6 p.m. You've then got the Bank of Canada uh, rate decision at 3 o'clock and you've got the oil inventories from the Department of Energy at the regular time of 3.30 as well. Um, and that is it. So going to leave it there, let you guys get on with the day. Any questions at all, just feel free to drop me a comment. If you're watching this on YouTube, happy to help. And thank you for getting us to over 20,000 subscribers now on the channel. Uh, massively appreciate it. Uh, and then otherwise, for the community, I'll see you online in the Discord room. Thanks so much, guys. Have a good day.